welcome to Unity Christ Church here in Myrtle Beach. Mm -hmm. This is a place that honors all people and all spiritual paths. So if you would, if you rise and join me with the first song, mm -hmm. Rise Up. Through you, for the glorious harmonies of life. May these 
words be fertile statements through which our future grows. Amen. 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 Again, good morning. I'm Dan. And I'd like to introduce the team that shares their talents and time to put this whole service together. See if I can get everybody right over there. It's David is our music leader. Yay. And we got Bill on the piano, Dan on drums, Tom, uh, Wayne on the uh, congos, Tom on the Celtic drums, Ryan, um, Dave, and Kevin. Yay. We got everybody? Yay. We got Bill on the piano. Yeah. And our singers this morning are Marlene and Patty and Sue. Yay. All right. And uh, running the sound system today is Melanie and Danielle. And we have Miss Bunny as our videographer. And Sandy is our usher today. And our youth teacher is Allison and a volunteer. Danielle. Danielle, again. This is one. All right. And of course, Reverend Margaret Pillar. The spiritual leader here will be doing the children's message and our meditation and the message this morning. If I can have the ushers come up, please, for the duo fund. This is the fund for our uh, noisy money. This is not the regular offering, but it is uh, for those folks who are in need in the community.
stayed in bed this morning where it was warm. <laughs> people, people in Myrtle Beach don't know how to do winter. They don't know how to do cold weather, do they? No. So what's going to happen this week? Is there going to be a special holiday this week? Stand up here with me, Mr. Michael. So, wow. Everybody misses seeing you. So. Yeah, but I look how tall he is. Here is his So what's going to happen this week? A special holiday? Fall. Fall. <laughs> and to celebrate fall, I brought, I brought us some lunch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those are acorns. You know what I did? This is my one of my things on my altar, and it's to celebrate fall. You know? Have you noticed all the leaves turning color? You know, I saw a pile of leaves. Yeah. I saw a pile of leaves. Because <laughs> what happens in the fall, the leaves... <coughs> Because the tree is getting ready to rest for a while so that in the spring it can be vibrant again with new growth. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. And so in the fall we have all these leaves that fall off the tree and they're beautiful colors, right? Yeah, orange and brown and green. And the acorns fall so that the little animals can have some food to eat. But also, what's in this acorn?
of what your perspective is and what you want to see unfold here at the church. So we're asking that you mark your calendars for January 19th, that's a Sunday, and we'll be having a community dialogue. And Carol has some survey forms, and you can pick those up from her after service, okay? It's a good time to give all of your input that you want to give, and you can even be anonymous, in case you need to be anonymous. Okay, and then annual unity, art day, that's next Sunday, December 1st. You should see my upstairs room, it looks like Santa's workshop. <laughs> so next Sunday, art day, we do need some food vendors to uh, help with food, right? Yeah, so if you're an artist, craftsperson, or a food vendor, please uh, pick up a, or sign up a sheet downstairs and let us know what you're going to do. Potluck. Everybody see that slide? Next Sunday, December 1st. Everybody say together, no, no potluck. Because see, when change happens, we all go, oh. So next Sunday, no potluck. We're going to buy our snacks and light lunch at the art day. Potluck is December 8th. And raise it up. Potluck is December 8th. And the reason is, next slide, we're going to have this special speaker, Simran Singh. She's gone from an arranged marriage to the Rebel Road. A one-woman show. She's going to be here Sunday, December 8th. She's got quite a resume. Any, Susan, anything you want to say about Simran? Because you brought her to us as a proposed speaker. Oh, please. <laughs> I'm not going to give you any facts. You can read those, you know me. <laughs> but what touches me so much about Simran is that she knew that it was time for her to really give new birth to a new self. And she had guts enough to do it. And what she is doing, traveling around the world, is pretty awesome. She's being very authentic, totally listening to her own heart, the universe, and living from there. She has done great things in order to do this, including leaving her marriage and living in a motorhome for a year. And she's written the newly published book, Conversations with the Universe. So that happens <laughs> December 8th, mark your calendar. And is that it? That's it for now. Well, this is the part of the uh, service that we normally do a reading about unity, and uh, Margaret and I decided we'd change it up a little today, and we're going to have let someone a little more famous than both of us yeah. tell a little bit about unity. You say words of things, and that they're so powerful. So what words do you turn to for comfort? Love. And again, see, I don't mean, I think, I think love is that condition in the human spirit so profound that it allows us to forgive. Mm -hmm. And it, it may be the energy which keeps the stars in the firmament. Yes. I'm not sure. It may be the energy which keeps the blood running smoothly through our veins. I'm not sure. But it's something beyond the explanation it can be used for anything you can't explain. Any good thing you can't explain. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Where do you go for solace, for comfort? Are there books that you read? Or when Maya Angelou needs comforting, mm -hmm. yeah. What, yeah. Do, what do you need? I, I'm a student of unity. And there's a book called Unity Church. Church. Unity Church. Mm -hmm. Maya first discovered the Unity Church in her 20s after her voice coach and mentor Fred Wilkerson invited her to a service there. Founded in 1889, Unity is a Christian movement that emphasizes affirmative prayer and education as a path to spirituality. I took a course in Unity about two years ago online, not to become a member, a minister, mm -hmm. but just to understand more deeply there's a book called Lessons in Truth. Wow. And in the book, there's a line, which is, God loves me. And when I came to read it to my then mentor, 
Frederick Wilkerson, uh, the late Frederick Wilkerson. Mm -hmm. I read God Loves Me, and he said, read it again. I said, God loves me. He said, read it again. Mm -hmm. Read it again. And finally, I said, God loves me. It still humbles me that this force, which made leaves and fleas and, and stars and rivers and, and you, loves me. Me, my Angela. It's amazing. I can do anything and do it well. Any good thing, I can do it. That's why I am who I am. Yes, because God loves me and I'm amazed at it. I'm grateful for it. Amen.
didn't mean to do this, but I went right over Javier, who put this PowerPoint together today, and we thank you so much for you, putting in that video. Do we have any visitors today? If you wouldn't mind, if you would stand and just tell us your name and where you're from, we'd like to get a package to you. Yep. My name is Andrea, and I'm visiting from Maryland, the DCA. Uh, All right. Andrea.
dreams have died And no one knows how you feel inside Come to the light where you can hide And God will comfort you
We give thanks for our ability to look into one another's eyes, to pause and embrace one another, to give thanks for one another and to one another for this experience that we call community. We give thanks this morning for our hearts and minds that continue to open day after day, <coughs> moment after moment. Spirit keeps drawing us deeper, higher, keeps calling us into even more expansive perspective, vision, understanding, wisdom. <clears throat> we give thanks. We give thanks that we keep saying yes to waking up, to expressing who and what we are, we give thanks. We give thanks for all those who came before us, on whose shoulders we stand, carrying us forward, the species of humankind. Intelligence and wisdom carried forward generation after generation, and expressing through us now. We give thanks. Spirit keeps evolving us that we continue to open for greater, <coughs> greater and greater capacities of love, of understanding. It seems there is no end to our capacity to wake up and be the light of the world. As we take a few moments of silence, we continue to let our hearts and our minds open to all for which we are grateful. heart of love, I invite you to speak names of those who you are holding in prayer. All those who have written in, we include in this, all those who have called in in prayer. Speak your names out loud or hold them silently in your heart. As always, we include in our blessings all world leaders, all communities and nations and villages and cities, our entire human family and all life, the four-legged, the winged ones, the minerals, the water, the oceans, the rivers, the air. We give thanks this morning that we remember that we, right here, all of us here, are the presence of spirit expressing. And we give thanks for knowing this in the name and in the life of that living presence of peace within each one of us. And so it is, and so we let it be. So how many of us thought twice about getting out of bed this morning? I thought, I wonder if I could call in my message. <laughs> It's better, or I'm paying more attention, or are the leaves really more vibrant this year? 
They are, aren't they? Yes. Oranges and yellows and reds and my goodness. I just give thanks for the ability to see all that's out there. No, I'm not exactly sh sure why, but I'm thinking of a story this morning. And it's a story that I have such great gratitude about the experience of this story. And it's when David and I were on our way to the LA airport back in 97, I think, from Santa Barbara. And the Rodney King trial had ended the day before. And there was rioting in LA. Seems like a long, 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 long time ago. And we were on the shuttle bus on the way to the LA airport, and we heard on the radio <coughs> of the shuttle bus that planes <coughs> were being shot at by a sniper. So we arrived at the airport, <laughs> and there was confusion, of course. There were people who were leaving the airport. Uh, we went ahead in, and they weren't letting many planes take off. And when the planes were taking off, there were two snipers actually shooting at me. So I'm looking around and going from desk to desk to desk, trying to figure out, can we get on another flight? Can we get on another flight? And suddenly I realized David's not with me. And I looked around, and I saw him sitting over by a pole. And he was sitting with his knees drawn up to his chest. This is in the book, which is why I know it's okay to tell the story. His knees drawn up to his, nest, his chest, his head on his knees, and I went over and sat down by him, and he was saying words, and I thought, he's praying. I thought, of course, why didn't I didn't know that. <laughs> so I sat down with him to pray. I didn't learn until later that David, in his mind, was back in, at, in the Da Nang airport, waiting for a plane to get out of Vietnam, and the snipers were shooting at the airplane station. I didn't realize till much later what was happening with him. So sitting with him, and I was at that point praying, I thought he was too, and in his way he was, he was praying to get out of the name. So, after a while, a woman came over to us, and she said, if it's okay with you, we're going to put you on a plane to Houston rather than Miami, and would you mind going to Houston, and from there we can get you? I said, right, we're going to Houston. <laughs> and we got on that plane, and this waiting area was full of people. Why she came up to us? And something in her heart, something in her awareness alerted her that these would be two people to help get on an airplane and get out of here. Maybe she was a former vet, I don't know. She saw something, she recognized something. It wasn't until we were on the plane on our way to Houston that David told me what was happening. So let's take a deep breath. So all of us have some kind of experience in our lives that every once in a while it wraps back through, right? And it brings up maybe the old wounding or the old sadness or the old fear, the old thing that makes us stop breathing. And so like the song just said, God will comfort you. We give ourselves over to allowing these old wounds to let themselves be known so that we can allow our wounds to heal. Right? And that day, David continued a healing process that would take several more years to release the hold that that kind of fear and anxiety has on us. We all, from time to time, need to get out of the Danang airport. Mm -hmm. We all, from time to time, feel like there's too much going
going on around us, it feels too uncertain, and we go into fear. So this kind of song, this song that comforts us, God will comfort you. It's what we're talking about today with our message, this idea of opening our hearts to love and compassion and forgiveness. It's out of our meditation book that we're using for the class. And this chapter is so important. I told them the other night, you know, if you don't read any other chapter, read this one because this one has in it meditations and healing process that will, I mean, they're better than any therapy that we can do. And I love counseling. I love psychotherapists. I, you know, I love that whole field. Heck, I have a master's degree in it. But you know what? My main master's degree is coming from being with you in this community. We're all in mastership training, right? We're all in master training, right? So this is one of the scariest things that we can do, opening our hearts and our minds to love and compassion and forgiveness. Like David was doing at that airport, I mean, for him to keep opening his heart to love and compassion and forgiveness around so many things of that war, and all of us to continue to open our hearts to love and compassion and forgiveness in this life journey when so many things have been wounding for us. This is the most courageous thing that we can do. It is the most courageous thing that we can do. And this is, this is the picture that I love that represents opening our hearts and our minds to what's called the thousand petal lotus, the, the beautiful presence within each one of us. And a lot of us say, well, you know, when my heart opens, then I will have love, compassion, and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. right? When I am a Christ is being, then I'll be able to forgive and love and have compassion. But it's interesting the way it works. If we practice love and forgiveness and compassion, our hearts and minds keep opening. And when our hearts and minds keep opening, we keep deepening into more love and compassion and forgiveness. How many of us have thought to ourselves, well, when life is a little easier, then I'll start being nicer? <laughs> <laughs> and haven't we found that as we practice compassion, as we practice kindness, as we practice love and forgiveness, that it gets easier and easier to be that in the world. Is that true? Absolutely. Silly? Absolutely true. So this is the way Alex Gray depicts the open heart, the open mind, and having access to what Chris Bache last week called the community of heaven, having access to the ancient wisdom that is encoded in our DNA, but also is all around us. He called it the community of heaven. And when our hearts and minds are open, we more easily access love, compassion, and forgiveness. Right? Even when we're sitting in an airport, even when we're feeling like life is shooting at us. Those are the times when we better practice opening our hearts and minds or we're going to create even more anxiety. And is this true? Yes. I know y'all are still in your cozy beds, but somebody say amen. Amen. Okay. amen. okay. So when our hearts are closed, and here's some of the clues. You know, how do I know when my heart is closed? You might be asking. Well, when our hearts are closed, these are some of the things that we're feeling. These are some of the things we're hanging on to. Fear, resentment, unresolved grief, jealousy, pain, grasping at something, wanting to hold on to the way things are, and clinging to what is ours and who I think I am. And you better not try to make me anything other than what I am. This is who I am. I'm not budging from it. And you are you and I am me. And I have a different religion, a different country, a different skin color. And so this is me. I'm separate from you. Even 
says no, that's not true. <laughs> so these are some of the things we feel when our hearts and minds are closed or closing. And you might add other things to this list. These are clues. And if this is where we choose to stay, it would be like David choosing to stay in this place of anxiety, thinking he's still at the Da Nang airport. But he, his heart kicked in, and he was praying, he was praying to get out of that fear and that pain. And if this is where we are right now still, or if this is where we still visit from time to time, we better start praying and meditating and deepening into our center, because we don't want to stay here. This is a place we pass through, this is a place we visit, this is a place we do our work in, but we don't want to stay there. Amen to that. So, one of our favorite heroes, Dalai Lama said, if we develop a good heart, real appreciation, love and compassion for others, our life will improve. Let's all read that together. If we develop a good heart, real appreciation, love and compassion for others, our life will improve. Dalai Lama was asked, what is your religion? Because you know, Buddhism really isn't considered a religion, although many of us call it a religion. He said, kindness is my religion. So what happens when we open our hearts and our minds to love, compassion, and forgiveness? Jesus said, as we think in our hearts, so are we. As we think in our hearts, so are we. So take a deep breath. What are you thinking in your heart right now? That's the energy of you right now. I used to have a teacher years ago who uh, had a healing presence. And people would walk near this individual and then report healing happening. And when asked about this, this teacher simply said, well, I walk in the atmosphere of my believing. Mm. And the believing of this teacher was that there was healing energy available to everyone at any moment. And so people were healed in that teacher's presence. Now, what happens with people in our presence? What happens when people walk into my presence, your presence? As I'm thinking in my heart, that's the presence that I am. So if I've got love, if I've got compassion cooking, if I've got forgiveness cooking, then that's what people are going to feel in my presence. That's what people are going to feel in your presence. It gets very humbling. It gets so humbling when we think about this. That we actually have the capacity to be a river of living water for other people. That we have the capacity to be a reservoir of healing energy for each other. Mm -hmm. It's very humbling. Oh, I don't know. I'm tired today. It's cold. I'm going to stay in bed. I don't want to be a healing present for anybody today. <laughs> I want to be, I, must, I want to, I don't want to see anybody today. You ever feel like that? Yes. That's okay. God will comfort you. That's okay. But sooner or later, Spirit's going to call you out. <laughs> sooner or later, Spirit's going to advise you to get up out of bed and go among the community. And when you do, you can wear a hoodie and sunglasses so nobody will see you and know who you are. But sooner or later, God's going to call you out. <laughs> so you have to take off the hoodie, take off the sunglasses, and let people see who you are. And what happens in your presence? I know a woman once who, in her desperate grief, stepped into her ministry of healing. And her 
heartbreaking grief, she allowed her life to open up to being a presence of healing for everyone who came into her, her uh, teaching circles and her healing circles. And the thing that opened her was her deep grief. So we're not, we're not saying don't allow your grief. We're saying let the grief work for you. Let those things that keep your heart closed and keep your mind closed, let those things be your teachers. If I'm feeling jealousy and resentment, why is that? What is mine to do? What is mine to work on? How can I transform that into being a healing energy? How can I transform the things that are keeping my heart and mind closed? Because the goal is to be a presence of healing and light and compassion in the world. And so if I'm not being that today, I've still got some work to do. Right? <laughs> Jesus mean as we think in our heart that's the way we are? What does that mean? It means we are, you know, the, the meditation book calls our hearts um, generators of love, generators of peace, generators of kindness. That's what our hearts are about. So, I have a book in my hand. It's called Daring Greatly. It's the book for our next Wednesday book group. Uh, you know, we stayed three years on Eckhart Tolle. <laughs> and we just actually sped through um, Untethered Soul. I have a feeling this one might be another long one. This is Brene Brown, Daring Greatly. Yes. And I just want to read you the first page. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. yes. uh, it's a speech by Theodore Roosevelt. And it was a speech called Citizenship and a Republic or The Man in the Arena. I'm sure he included women too. Uh, delivered at the Sorbonne, Paris, France in 1910. It is not the critic who counts. Not the man who points out who the strong, when the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiant, valiantly, who errs, who comes up short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms and great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumphs of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring great. greatly. <laughs> That's the book we're starting. So why is it important to read it this morning? Because I've said this, and I've heard many other people say it. I don't care what happens. I'm not letting anybody else into my heart ever again. <laughs> because people cannot be trusted. I know who you are. <laughs> I've said it. <laughs> And spirit just keeps saying, nah. as you're thinking in your heart, that's what you are. What you're experiencing in your life is being generated from what you're thinking in your heart. What does it mean to be in forgiveness? You know, it means that I'm going to give, I'm going to open up my heart and mind for understanding and for awareness about who you are and what you are so I can understand more deeply why you did what you did. I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to give this opening of heart and mind to you to be an understanding of you so I'm not standing in judgment of you. I'm going to give you this gift and in return I'm going to receive the blessing of not having to carry that judgment and that resentment about you. I'm going to let myself off the hook. 
I'm going to release myself from all the energy it takes to carry the resentment and the anger about you or about that group, about that community, about that church, about that priest, that pastor, that rabbi, that therapist, that teacher, that ex-spouse, that ex-lover, that ex-colleague, worker. <sighs> I am going to open my heart and mind for understanding of who you are and why you are the way you are right here, right now. I'm going to release you from my expectations of what I think you ought to be. I'm going to release you from my expectations about what I think you should be doing. I'm going to take my bossy finger and put it back in my pocket. <laughs> I'm going to open my heart and mind to who you really are, not what your actions may say. I'm going to open my heart to you. And that's not just for people that I know well. It's for those that I'm reading about in the news. It's the world leaders. I'm going to cease Convention about what I think you should be doing. I'm going to open up my heart and mind to you and hold you in prayer so that our world can transform. Amen. Compassion and forgiveness and love means I'm going to keep my heart open even when it feels like painful things are happening. Mm. This is a practice. <laughs> And it's not for sissies. <laughs> I'm not kidding. This is a warrior consciousness of the heart. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of courage to stay open when people are saying, well, you know, it could have been done this way if only you had... Breathe? <laughs> I don't know about you. But there really weren't any manuals in my bassinet when I was <laughs> Here's the good news. The manual is within our DNA. The manual of how to be, the manual of beingness is within our very encoding. It's within us. So what do I do? We have our prayer. We have our meditation, we have listening, we have contemplating. We have the practice of keeping our hearts and minds open so that we can access the information we need on how to keep our hearts and minds open when the world is going wacky. That's a scientific term. <laughs> Let's take a deep breath. In the beginning. <laughs> In the beginning of your embodiment this time, your incarnation this time. In the beginning. Long before you got into the physical body, long before you were given a name, long before you were birthed, long before you were actually in the body. Think about where you were. <clears throat> Long before you came into this body that walks and talks and moves and eats and breathes, gets sick, gets well, has baby, long before you're in the body, where were you? In spirit. And in spirit, we were in a consciousness of complete knowing that all is well, all is working as it should. All is in divine alignment. And then when we get to the body, we started to forget. That doesn't mean the information is gone. It only means we forgot how to access it. So this is a part of what prayer and meditation, singing these songs that we sing every Sunday, it opens our hearts and our minds. I was singing that song all week long. And Charlene and I were playing the CD during the week. 
God will comfort you. The presence of the living intelligence of all life lives within us and it guides us. Now I'm going to tell you one more story and I'm going to sit down because some of you are going to think, God bless her. She's just, wow. <laughs> so, hold me in prayer. We're going to end with a story. Some of us in this community know that we are surrounded by heavenly presence. And some of us, when we've done our healing work, can smell sometimes roses, a sweet scent. Some of us have thought that scent had to do with Mother Mary. Some of us just aware that the angels were present, that heavenly presence was with us. In meditation group on Tuesday night, some of them were smelling this sweet scent. At the Mayor Baba Center a few weeks ago, some of us smelled that sweet scent in the barn there, in that meditation barn. Some of us have had this happen when we're doing Reiki or other kinds of healing work, so we're aware of that phenomenon. Well, yesterday I was on the back deck working with my plants, the vertical garden that Tom built, and I'm working with my plants and I could, all of a sudden, this beautiful perfume just wafted through, and I'm looking around, what in the world is in bloom now? What is that? I couldn't find anything. So I'm working with it left. So I'm working with my plants, and I smell it again, this sweet perfume. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, it's the angels. I'm surrounded, it's beautiful, and the scent got stronger and stronger, and they'll never believe this. This is fabulous. And then I looked over at this little pansy, this little yellow pansy. And I went over to smell it, and you know this perfume's coming from this little pansy? This giant perfume is coming from this little pansy. I didn't know. You probably knew pansies have a sweet scent. I, I didn't know, know that. Mm -mm. Do they? Only yours. I <laughs>
hold each other in prayer. And as we think, Jesus said, in our hearts, that's the way we become. We walk in the atmosphere of what we're thinking and feeling. We become that presence. So today, take a deep breath and we make one more commitment to being the atmosphere, being the presence of love, of compassion, of forgiveness. It's the most courageous thing that we can do. Mm -hmm. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you, Reverend Martin. I don't know about it, all of you, but I sure feel like I've been in church this morning. <laughs> <laughs> so, He's good. You know what a great message to have on this week of Thanksgiving as we move into the families. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
announcements for the week? Okay, book group, Dairy Greatly starts this Wednesday. <laughs> and we have the attractions book. I have my Lowe's coupon with me to go grocery shopping after church today. And next Sunday, December 1st, an adventure of life. It will be our first Sunday of Advent. And we have won this blessing right after service. And next week, remember, bring your uh, extra change and, and money to shop at Unity Art Day and plan on having a snack after church for that event. Okay, let's all make our circle. And we are going to do our prayer for protection. For all of us in this circle, for all of those we're holding in our hearts. It would be hard to believe. I feel like we've uh, forgotten to announce something, but that can't really be true, can it? Remember, <laughs> to, get, remember to get your survey from Carol O'Dwyer if you want to participate in that community dialogue. Okay, we take a deep breath. This is for ourselves and all those we're holding in our hearts. The light of God surrounds us. The love of God enfolds us. The power of God protects us. The presence of God watches over us. Wherever we are, God is and all is well. In our peace song, we sing it like a prayer. We sing it like we mean it. Here we go.